Hi guys, welcome to this episode of Kung Fu Report. We're going to talk about classic Kung Fu's application. Today we're going to continue to talk about the low back fist from the last episode. Um, but instead of going against attack, we're going to go around the opponent's defenses because some of you were asking that. Actually, a lot of you. See you when you get back. Chris, please come on in. Okay, so actually maybe you'll see it better on this side. Um, on the last episode, we did a very simple thing about blading the body and mainly just striking with the least side of the body. And a combination that I used was a low back fist and elbow to a double punch, right? If you want to see that, please look at the last episode and Chris will leave a link below for that. And to demonstrate that, so Chris attack, it was basically this. So when Chris comes in, I hit low, and then this is just a distraction hit the groin, go for the elbow, and then you can even go for the throat or diaphragm, or the, the throat this way, or even to the face. Right? And then um, another thing I show is that off this, because you're in extreme close range, it's very difficult to react to the next attack. So instead of trying to pick a punch out of the air, it's better to actually intercept. So Chris attacks it better. Yeah, if I'm even here, Chris attacks, you can just use your shoulders, see? Or if Chris attacks, and I'm just, if that throws a straight punch, you can just, sorry, a little hard. Yeah. Sorry. 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 You can just use your elbow. So after that episode aired, people were asking, oh yeah, but what if the guy doesn't let you hit him and he's covering? So um, what I want to say is, when you're training this combination with the low back fist elbow to the double punch, that is just how the form goes to learn a combination. When you actually use it, it can be done in any order. You don't have to go low back fist, elbow, and double punch. You can go double punch, elbow, and low back fist. You can also go elbow, and then low back fist, and then double punch. Any order is fine. Because any order is fine, when a guy covers, now it's easy to deal with. If Chris covers, right? And I do big rotation shots, like I'm coming around this way, going around with my body. If I do that, even if I go half speed, or maybe 25% speed, Anytime Chris wants, he can clinch me, okay? There's no way I can stop him because I'm opening up as soon as I do rotation. Even though I'm doing very small rotation. That's why most professional fights people end up in a clinch. I'm not saying that's bad, I'm saying that's one way of operating. But if I stick to the combination that I was demonstrating previously from the Hakka fist, of the low back fist, double hit in the elbow, and it could be done in any order, then when Chris covers, what I just did is I did the low back fist, followed by the elbow, and then I hit. So that's one order. Or I might go to the elbow first, and then low back fist. And Chris, he can't really clinch, right? If he tries to clinch. Because as soon as he tries to clinch, right, that low back fist is coming in and then into the throat. Very difficult, or he tries to clinch, that double fist is coming, right? So that combination is designed to stop that kind of center line attack. I mean, off center line attack. So that was the double punch, the low back fist, or he goes in, that elbow, right? And I'm stopping here, but you don't have to stick to that idea. If he comes in, right? Clinch or something, Chris. This goes directly back to the chin if you wanted to, right? If you wanted the rotation work, Right from here, now you can start doing rotation work. Okay. So all the arts actually combine. Or if you play it from the bottom, that gets to come back over to You can again go back to rotation. If the guy steps. If the guy steps up, you can go and kick him. It doesn't matter, right? So everything connects. It doesn't have to be in a very specific order. When we get back, let's talk a little bit more about this. Hey guys, so there's a few concepts, uh, concepts that I want to talk about today is um, that combination that I just did. In a previous episode, I talked about how to use it against attacks, and today I talk about how to use it against defense, if the guy's covering and trying to clinch, right? The idea is you don't want to have a separate set of techniques against someone's offense and against someone's defense. The same technique, you should be able to use it offensively and de defensively, right? You want as small amount of techniques as possible with as many application of those techniques, which is the reverse of learning where you're always collecting new tricks, right? 
and then you're very limited because you can't adapt. So it's the same as the Hakka fist or any Gong Fu system for that matter. When you learn the core movements, those movements are meant to be used against defense, against his offense, against blah, 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 blah. So you want to train that adaptation. So when you're learning the form, you can't take it so literally, just like when we're doing Wing Chun. There's just a set of ideas, right? And the second thing I want to talk about is, on purpose today, after I finished the Hakka fist on Chris, I also follow with other martial arts like Wing Chun or you can go to kicking and, and on and on. And because I want to highlight the idea if possible that it's about the angles of how you're moving and distance, right? So it's not so much about one art, you have to do it like this. Nothing is cast in stone, there's no rules. Which bring me to my second point is, I received a question, someone asked, why is it when I demonstrate Hakka Fist is 99.9% .9 in extreme close range? And the reason is because, um, if you haven't watched my earlier episodes, I talk about the history of the Hakka people. Today I'm not gonna talk about it because I already talked about it before. Mainly the Hakka tribe, when they were attacked in the villages, it was mainly for self-defense. So, because of that, if you ever get jumped before or get robbed, most crime happens in extreme close range. That's why it emphasizes close range combat. So the sociological reason in the history is very important, much like if you look at um, karate, for example, right? If you look at Okinawa karate, not all of them, but a lot of them, they still train like the old days, where it's mostly for a village self-defense situation. That's why in a lot of the dojos, they train in the dark, because most crime happens in the dark. And that's also why it's very close. But as soon as karate was brought to Japan, it became a dueling system, like a tournament, like sparring. So it was like a social violence, a artificial entertaining fair fight, not a, not a criminal assault. Because of that, you see that karate eventually became very wide distance. And that's why, for example, uh, if you look at Japanese karate, especially Shotokan, they have some of the fastest um, closing ability. They can close six feet really, really, really fast. And they trained it a lot. A lot of on guard position bouncing up and down. A lot of warning, in other words. Biggest telegraph on the planet is on guard position. And then he's bouncing up and down. And boom, he darts on like an Olympic fencer. Amazing skill set, right? But that only happened because it's dueling and social violence. If you look at the original karate in Okinawa, for example, it was all very close range, training in the dark, because it is uh, self-defense. Circling back to Hakka Fist is the same. It was a village art to defend against criminal assaults back in their day. Because of that, it's extreme close range, right? So history becomes very important. Unlike, like, let's say, uh, Cantonese martial art, which historically, they, they were challenging each other to fights all the time. And a lot of, a lot of like, you know, my style's better than your stuff, and then a lot of dueling, a lot of tournaments, um, a lot of shit talking, a lot of bullying and humiliating people and forcing them to fight you. That, that kind of behavior, which is universal, so I'm not insulting the Cantonese people. Um, but the Hakka people was very different. They, their protocol and the way they live was very different. Their culture was based on, look, people don't like us. They're discriminating against us. They're always robbing us. So how about this? Don't tell anyone that you train. Don't show off. Don't pick fights. Don't humiliate people. Keep a low profile. Do not let anyone know you do martial art. So that was the way they lived. They were tiptoeing around because they only use it if their family or themselves are in danger. Because historically, the Hakka people were always being attacked because they were nomads, right? Even when you look at Hakka houses, they're built like a mushroom. It's a circular wall. Where unless you speak Hakka needs, you're not even allowed in that duplex. And it's designed in such a way that whoever enters or breaks into it, all the different families has a higher ground where they can attack an intruder. So they were very defensive even when they are building houses, is what I'm trying to say. So of course when they walk out of the house in the villages, as soon as they speak, because they have a thick Hakka accent, people know they're Hakkanese and they'll get attacked or whatever. So because of that, even when they they don't really talk unless they need to, in other words. And martial arts the same. They don't go around wearing any kind of outfit that suggests that they knew martial art. They don't carry classical Chinese martial art weapons. Um, they don't do public demonstrations. They don't challenge other clans. And I'm talking back in the old days, in the Qing Dynasty, for example. And I used to ask my grandfather about this a lot. Why were they so conservative compared to the Cantonese who were, you know, always dem doing public demonstration, challenging people to fight and so forth. So that really resonated with me because I really like that culture because it's, it's very close to Taoism where violence is looked down upon and you shouldn't do it unless you absolutely need to. And I think that's a good way to live, not just a good way to practice martial arts, right? Okay, so anything else, Chris?
Uh, no, that's yeah. it. For that's it. Okay, so one more thing I want to say. You've been getting a lot of messages. The Hakka series will be released on September 10th. So uh, that's coming up really close. Um, another thing, a question is how long would it be? It's going to be about five to six episodes, right? Because as I explained in the earlier episode, what I'm planning to do because of the many requests I get, I'm going to continue from Wing Wing Chen 1 and 6, of course. But you guys have been asking me a lot about Xing Yi, Yichuan, post training, Qi Gong, Long Fist, uh, Hakka Fist. So there's no way I can film that in the long term because just Hakka alone, I can do that for five years. And it will not end, it's such a big thing, right? Same thing with Xing Yi and each one. So instead of doing that, what I'm gonna do is film a mini series and then of Hakka, go into each one, do a mini series, then long fist, non-classical kung fu. Um, actually, I won't film on non-classical kung fu and then self-defense and all these topics you guys are requesting, then I'll circle back to Hakka. So in other words, we'll have like season one, season two, season three. That way you'll get what you want without waiting five years. So that would be in the full immersion program. All this stuff I'm talking about will only be available in the student library for those that are supporting us on our website. Okay. Okay, guys, train hard, stay safe. See you next week.